Ruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for attending. Welcome to our home. The uh, lecture tonight on to my thoughts, um, I thought it would be an important thing, as we're in right now, called home versus office. You know, this pandemic has changed many things in our lives. Social distancing, masks, hand washing, and of course, working from home. It's not like working from home is something new. After all, people have been doing this for years. However, working from home is the exception, not the rule. Over the last two years, well, more and more people have opted, while others have been compelled to work from home. There, ha there have certainly been many advantages to doing so. But as we know, every solution creates two new problems. So let us examine this phenomena of working from home versus working at an office. You know, I would always tell my employees that they should separate their work life from their home life. Think of it as two feet. Anyone can stand on one foot for a while. However, if you're standing with both feet tied together, then in reality, you are standing on only one foot. If that foot gives out, then you are no longer standing. You are lying on the floor. So separating our job from our home creates much more stability in our lives. It affords us the possibility of forgetting our problems, at least temporarily, which many times is really all we really need. Just a little time and distance, and then we can revisit our problems. Somehow, then, our decisions are based on logic and reason and not on unbridled emotion. There are, of course, many advantages of working at home. When you wake up, you're already at work. You don't have to commute to an office, a savings of both time and money. Also, you can dress much more casually or just stay in your pajamas. You don't have to deal with office politics or drama. And even though you may work the same amount of hours still, you are much more in control of how you schedule your time. Of course, there are also negatives. There are many distractions to working at home, especially when your children are not going to school. Since you are at home, you may be asked to perform certain chores that would not arise if you were working at your office, such as babysitting the children while your wife runs her errands, changing diapers, making meals, cleaning up after the kids, laundry, helping with homework, refereeing your children, and dealing with financial obligations. The list goes on and on. As your wife constantly reminds you, being a stay-at-home mom, well, that's a full-time job. Being in a work environment, though, many times helps us to focus on the task at hand. In addition, we miss being around other co-workers, face-to-face, personal interaction. I mean, that really, that makes, many times may helps us to stimulate our crea creative juices, something that even Zoom may not be able to accomplish. Also camaraderie, building a team, tuning into the power of the many. In today's society, Many women have opted to enter the workforce. They, too, leave their home in the morning and have a job that they perform. However, due to this pandemic, it feels like all of us have become stay-at-home moms. You know, this fact may well attribute to the strain in marriages and a 34% increase in the number of divorces in the United States and around the world. The pressures of family, families all being together has caused an increase of over 9% in domestic violence. This pandemic has certainly taken its toll. So, so how does the Torah and a religious lifestyle deal with this question of home or office? Now, the first time in creation that God uses the term not good is in the portion of Bereshit when God states, Lo tobios ha'adam levado, that it's not good for man to live alone. So we read that God created us to be social creatures. At the same time, the cure many times can be worse than the illness. In our social interactions, it is our social interactions pardon me, that cause the most difficulty and pain. Home and family can be the cure or the cause of our present state of mind. More often than not, the deeper that you love, huh, the deeper your pain. We expect the most from family. One of the reasons that we have friends is because we accept them as they are. We don't necessarily try to change them. 
However, when it comes to marriage and children, well, it's all about change. We are constantly trying to help our children to grow, to become better people. <laughs> our wives feel the same about us. They were given to us by God Almighty for us to become better people. As God stated when he created Chava, the first woman, as an Azer Konegdo, as a helpmate opposite him, for Adam, for first man. Now, marriage is really a coming together of opposites. Type A personalities marry type B personalities. And then, <laughs> the fun begins. Each partner trying to persuade the other that their way is correct. There is a saying that opposites attract. <laughs> well, I don't really believe that to be true. If there was such a positive attraction, why would they both feel a need to change each other? God has a master plan. He doesn't want us to be either A or B personalities. What he wants is C personalities. He wants both a husband and wife to grow, to become better than they were separately. He wants them to learn the art of compromise. You know, the Torah makes it very clear that the praise of a woman is being in the tent, her house. As we read in the first book of the Torah in the portion of Baera, the three angels that Avinu had taken in as guests asked him, Aye Sarah Ishtacha, where is Sarah, your wife? Now Rashi comments on this verse and says that the ministering angels knew where she was. Nevertheless, they asked about her whereabouts to make known that she was modest so as to make her more beloved to her husband. We read in many places in the Torah that a wife is referred to as Habayit, the house. It is the woman who makes the home, not the man. If, a woman, if, a, if the woman of the house is religious, then you have a religious home. If only the man is religious, well, then all you have is a religious individual who lives in that house. One has to wonder, what lessons does God want us to learn from this pandemic? In reality, many husbands have no idea whatsoever what being a stay-at-home mom entails. It is a multifaceted position which demands attention 24-7. A wife is, she is a wife, a lover, mother, babysitter, friend, therapist, confident advisor, cook, baker, bottle washer, launderer, cleaning lady, shopper, alarm clock. She's many times the first one to be up in the morning and the last one to go to sleep at night. She is a secretary, tutor, chauffeur, financial advisor, party planner, handyman, professional warrior, nurse, teacher, motivator, judge, and peacemaker. She is the place where the buck stops. She is there for all the needs of her husband and children. As if all of this wasn't enough, she still has obligations as a sibling, friend, daughter, mother-in-law, volunteer, and of course, her own deep and real relationship with God Almighty. With all of these hats that she wears, the most difficult factor may well be that work and home are the same place. She doesn't have the luxury of getting away from all of her jobs. Now, due to the pandemic, many husbands have been forced to work from home. Working from home has been a wake-up call for many of them. Some have gained a new appreciation for all the many tasks that their wives perform daily. Before this pandemic, many men would come home from work tired. After all, a full day work at the job. All they wanted to do is unwind, relax, take a little me time. After all, they earned it. They had no idea what their spouse's day was like. They just assumed that since she was home all day, she should be well rested and happy. <laughs> of course, that's not always the case. As I pointed out, being a stay at home mom is not a stroll in the park. So how does all this connect to a religious lifestyle? Prayer and Torah study are essential to an observant Jew. Even though one can pray and study from home, it is preferable to do so in a synagogue or a base hamedrash, a study hall. But why? Well, there are different answers to this question. Prayer and study, Torah study, are integral parts of Judaism. They are not a luxury. They are a necessity a significant part of the daily life of an Orthodox Jew. Praying and learning at home comes with many distractions. When we are at the synagogue or study hall, we hopefully can focus on our prayers and study with a deeper sense of commitment and concentration. Not only that, but we have the ability 
to feed off the energy and dedication of others that are in attendance. Whether it is the minion, a quorum of at least men, about at least 10 men, when we pray, or a study partner, a chavrusa, when we learn. This interaction and camaraderie are an, are an essential part of our religious lifestyle. It is all about people. As I mentioned before, a study hall is referred to by the Hebrew words Bet HaMedrash, which translates as a house of study. Following that thought, a house of prayer should be called a Bet HaTfila, a house of prayer. However, the Hebrew word for synagogue is Bet HaKneset, a house of gathering. Why that name? So it teaches us a great lesson, that more important than people coming together to pray is that they come together in friendship and camaraderie. God, much like any loving parent, would much rather have his children live together in harmony than sing his praises. You know, we read in the Torah in the portion of Ayigash that Yaakov Avinu, Yaakov our father, before he went down to Egypt to live, sent his son Yehuda ahead of the family, Rashi tells us, to establish a house of study, a place where the family could go to learn, Torah. Uh, why was that so important to Yaakov? After all, the family members could have learned Torah individually in their own homes. So from Yaakov we learn the importance of being around other people. More often than not, they inspire us and we inspire them. A win-win situation. You know, when I was younger, I spent two years in the Yeshiva High School. While there, I was privileged to observe and participate in learning Torah on a much higher level. Over the years, I have stepped into many yeshivot, where a sea of young men are totally engrossed in their give and take discussion with their study partner, both pushing each other to reach greater heights of reason and understanding of the Torah, which God our Father has given us as a gift. When they learn or pray, they have a tendency to sway back and forth, what is referred to with the Yiddish word as shuckling, swaying. When you walk into a large base medrash, a study hall, you can hear the sound of the choir, a chorus of voices harmonizing together. Here and there, a loud voice pierces the air as one student is passionately trying to rebuttal the statement made by his study partner. There is an electricity in the air. It can be mesmerizing. There is no greater feeling of awe and trepidation that one can experience as when the congregation gathers together for prayers on the high holidays. There was another time in my life when I have witnessed people lost in swaying and humming. I had an occasion to visit a mental institution weekly for an extended period of time. When I sat in the dining room, what I saw was patients swaying to and fro. And then I, heard, then I would hear the sound of humming coming from their lips. I found it very interesting and I wondered what was the connection what connection could there be between these two seemingly different scenarios? You know, I think that in both places, the study hall and the mental institution, those people that attended were present on both a physical and spiritual level. This fact can be seen through their involuntary actions of swaying and humming. You know, the book of Mishlei tells us, Ner Hashem Nishmat Adam, that the candle of God is the soul of a person. So within each and every one of us burns a spark of divinity, the candle of God, a flame that flickers to and fro, wanting to leave its wick, the body of man, and return to its higher source, the Shekhinah, God Almighty himself. Whenever we are able to focus on the spiritual rather than the physical, our body is automatically elevated together with our soul. As we see in the world today, living in harmony is easier said than done. You know, we read about King Ahav, who was an evil king of the ten tribes of Israel. Uh, he, was, he served idols. Yet when his troops went to battle, no one died. But why? The sages tell us because there was love and harmony amongst his people. On the other hand, when the troops of Dovna Melech, King David, went to battle, they did die. As we read with Uri Achiti, the husband of Bathsheba, David sent him to fight on the front lines, and he died in battle. Why did David's troops die? Because they did not live in peace amongst themselves. Now, in the Torah, we do see that many of our ancestors were farmers, shepherds, peddlers, and even businessmen. Many of the early rabbis worked menial jobs to support their families. 
They would leave their homes in the morning to make their living and return in the evening. This was seen as the natural order. There is a saying that goes, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Separation many times can help a marital relationship. It lets us miss the other person. Instead of getting into each other what other's way, you can hopefully brighten up each other's day. You know, I remember when my father retired <laughs> after a short time at home. My mother begged me to give him a job in my deli. There are few things in life that are black and white, black or white, excuse me, for the most part. Things are more often than not gray. The deciding factor as to whether something is positive or negative is based really on our perception. Winston Churchill was quoted as saying, the definition of success is going from one failure to another with no lack of enthusiasm. There can be no doubt in our minds that this pandemic has created many new and different challenges in all of our lives. The question that we have to address is, how have we handled this pandemic and all the challenges that it has created? In reality, I believe this pandemic has not so much created new challenges. What it has done is exposed existing challenges, the cracks in our relationships, those that we have managed either to ignore or just didn't realize existed before. Those relationships that were solid before this pandemic, well, may actually have benefited, grown from this time out in our lives. God is always giving us a wake-up call. The problem is that we keep hitting the snooze button. Well, that may have worked before the pandemic, but now we have been forced to acknowledge and confront many of the issues that we were able to ignore before. Being at home and trying to balance work and family at the same time demands attention and some ingenuity. So the bottom line, no two people are the same and so no two marriages are the same. The only thing that is universal is that we are all concerned about this pandemic. So what does the Torah tell us concerning the question of home or office? That if possible, a woman should be at home taking care of her house and children, and that a man should be at work or at shul taking care of the financial and spiritual needs of himself and his family. We need to know that like every other major event in history, this pandemic will permanently change our lives. You know, but that doesn't have to be bad. Every difficulty brings with itself the possibility to improve, make ourselves better, our families and the world a better place. Let us not waste this opportunity, as the Tzemach Tzedek said in Yiddish, Trach good, sign good. Think good, and it'll be good. And with that thought, let us herald in the coming of Mashiach Zakena quickly and in our time. I want to thank you very much for listening and for attending. Again, may God bless you with health and with safety and with success, again, this being the weekend before New Year's. Again, happy and healthy New Year's to a prosperous one to you and your family. Again, God should bless you with only good, revealed good, and all that um, you do. Thank you again very much for attending.